Hello, Gold viewers. I'm Fiona Langsharp, IBCLC and Public Relations Manager for the 2015 Gold Alumni Online Conference. Welcome to my interview with Dr. Allison Hazel Baker. Hi, Allison. How are you doing today? I'm doing very well. Thank you so much, Fiona. Well, I'm really excited to be listening to your second part of your talk, and I'm just going to read the title so everyone knows what you're going to be talking about here. It's called Getting Down to the Details Part 2, Anatomy and Physiology of Infant Suck, Muscles and Fascia of the Neck, Cranium, and Thoracic Inlet. So that's quite a mouthful. That's, it sounds like we're going to be getting a lot of information in your talk, Allison. I'm very excited. Oh, I'm glad you're excited. It's an exciting topic for me and something that I think that a lot of people really enjoy hearing more about, even though it can be a bit on the dry side, perhaps. Well, I don't know. I've listened to you before, and I've always enjoyed, you know, the way that you explain things just makes so much more sense to me, and I know that I'm not the only one that thinks that way, so I'm sure our viewers are certainly looking forward to hearing you, um, hearing your explanation of things. So I have a few questions for you, and I'm just going to start at the top here, just so that you can let us inside and uh, to know a little bit more about this topic. So here's the first one. Why should we be concerned about fascia? Well, fascia is the prime mover in the human body. And uh, so we oftentimes think that muscles are what moves our, our skeleton around so that we can be mobile. But the reality is that fascia is what tells the muscle what to do. Fascia is proprioceptive. So it informs the brain where the body is in space. And it is interoceptive so that it informs the brain what's going on on the inside of the body so that there can be adjustments made to maintain dynamic equilibrium. That is just amazing. And you know, it is true, I think, for me as well. I always assumed that it was muscles um, that were primary until um, I got some uh, fasciitis in my foot and then learned a lot when I went to physio. So what would cause a restriction of a fascia in an infant? Well, you, you pointed to uh, one particular cause, and that would be inflammation. So any time that somebody has uh, an allergic response, for example, there can be inflammation, and that can create a restriction in fascia. Uh, other things can be things like a baby born with a cord around, around its neck. There are multiple layers of fascia in the neck, so a cord that tightens down during the birth process certainly can create some restrictions in that area. But other structural problems can create some restrictions with, uh, with fascia in various places. So let's say, for example, that the baby has torticollis. Well, the torticollis, uh, the, that contracture of the muscle, which can be mediated by the fascia, um, can create further problems with restrictions in the uh, fascia in that general area. So this is one of the reasons why we might find a uh, baby's tongue pulled back into its throat, mimic mimicking a tongue tie as a result of torticollis. Yeah, and that I've heard you talk a little bit about before, um, where it can mimic that type of tongue tie. So I'm really, I, I'm so interested to hear more about this, Allison. I, you know, I've been talking about it for a while with you personally, but um, just having a little sneak peek today has got my juices flowing again. So I'm excited to hear more. So lastly, I'm just going to ask you briefly: What are the options are there for treating an infant with facial restrictions? Any modality, bodywork modality, that is designed to work specifically with fascia is going to be a good choice. That may be um, uh, rolfing, although rolfing can be a little bit too much for a baby to handle. It might be myofascial release technique. It might be craniosacral therapy. Even certain types of chiropractic are designed to uh, release fascial restrictions, um, as well as osteopathic technique performed by osteopaths in certain countries, where they've maintained the uh, original uh, philosophical orientation of the their work. In the United States, not so much. Uh, osteopaths in the United States are very much like MDs and are trained very much like MDs. It's kind of mm -hmm. a lost art. Um, but in other countries, osteopathy looks very much like the application of craniosacral therapy. 
Well, that just sounds so exciting. And you know what's important to hear from you is do defining some of these things for us because, you know, how do we know? And I know that you've done that over a long period of time and through your own research um, of learning about these different types of uh, techniques and the different modalities and, and who can do what. And even we know the vast difference that we have uh, between countries. So, again, another um, great topic as well that I know that you've addressed before. So thank you so much, Alison. We have actually run out of time, and I could sit and chat with you longer for sure. But I know that we uh, we don't want to give too much away, and I know everyone is excited to listening to you soon. Um, and that your presentation will be, of course, on um, the 26th of January. So we're looking forward to hearing you. And again, the title of your presentation, Getting Down to Part 2, Anatomy and Physiology of Infant Suck and fascia of the neck, cranium, and thoracic inlet. So thank you again for being with me here today, Allison. It's been lovely chatting with you. Thank you, Fiona.